in homeostasis, we also have to talk about something called the control of blood glucose concentration, which means to say, you know, maintaining the optimum blood glucose concentration in our body. If you, for example, look at this graph right here, so we have the optimum blood glucose concentration, we also have above optimum and below optimum. Above optimum means the blood has too much glucose, below optimum means the blood has very little glucose, right? And the red color line, the red dotted line means that if it goes beyond that level, it's too dangerous for the body. That's what it means. So, for example, let's say you had an optimum blood glucose concentration, but you ate something sweet, like, for example, chocolates, or you ate a vanilla ice cream, or you took a drink, a, you took a sweet drink. In that case, the blood glucose concentration will go up. And in homeostasis, what your body has to do is your body has to correct it, and it has to bring it back down. And that response is called negative feedback. So it brings it back to normal. Conversely, also, if you were to exercise or you were fasting, especially uh, during certain months, like especially Ramadan, when you're fasting, um, the blood glucose concentration might go down, all right? But to prevent it from reaching dangerous levels, your body will respond by negative feedback and bring it back up. So this is homeostasis. But the question here is, how exactly is the blood glucose concentration controlled? Now, before we understand how the blood glucose concentration is controlled, we have to explain why we have to regulate the blood glucose concentration. Why shouldn't it be too high or too low? Now, for example, if you have a low blood glucose concentration, which means to say the amount of glucose in the blood is very low, right? In that case, the cells, your body cells will receive very little glucose. And this is bad because if your cells receive very little glucose, less respiration will happen because your cells need glucose for respiration to produce ATP. So if they don't receive glucose, they will undergo less respiration and they will produce less ATP. And this can be dangerous because it can cause your cells to die. Your brain cells especially constantly need a supply of glucose from the blood to continuously function. At any moment, if the brain cells stop receiving glucose, it can be quite dangerous for us. Right, So it's not just for brain cells, but most cells in your body as well. For example, uh, muscle cells. Your muscle cells need to get the glucose so that they can undergo respiration, so that they can produce ATP, and therefore they can contract. If the blood glucose concentration is very low, your body cells cannot function properly. So that's simple because glucose is a source of energy for the cell. But a lot of times, students have problems explaining why is it dangerous if the blood glucose concentration is very high. Some of my students will be like, oh yeah, I know this, this is diabetes, uh, where there's too much sugar or there's too much glucose in your blood. And for the most part, you will be right. But my question is, why is it dangerous if your blood glucose concentration is very high? Now, to keep things very simple, there can be many reasons why it is dangerous, but we're just going to keep this simple. When there's too much glucose inside the blood, what happens is it causes the solute concentration in the blood to increase because there's too much glucose. Glucose is a solute. And the higher the glucose concentration in the blood, the lower the water potential inside the blood. So what happens? In this case, water from the cell will move into the blood by a process known as osmosis. And this causes our body cells to dehydrate and it might also lead to cell death as well. So for example, if you have too much glucose inside your blood due to, I don't know, diabetes or you eat something very sugary, you will feel thirsty because your cells are losing water and because the blood has a lower water potential as well. That is why your body has to make sure that the blood glucose concentration cannot be too low or too high. It has to be at the optimum level. So, how is blood glucose concentration regulated? Remember, in the 
flow of homeostasis. It starts with the stimulus detected by receptors, goes to sends a signal to the control center, which sends a signal to the effector, and then the response is the corrective action. And all of this is referred to as the negative feedback. We've seen this in the first video on homeostasis. We also saw this when we were talking about osmoregulation in the previous video. So the same principle applies with blood glucose concentration, except different parts of the body does this because uh, osmoregulation is done by the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. We talked about that in the previous video, but for blood glucose concentration, it's different. For example, the stimulus here is the change in blood glucose concentration where it goes either higher or lower than normal. And it is detected by receptors, but the receptors in this case are referred to as something called the islets of Langerhans. And the islets of Langerhans are these groups of tissues that are found in the organ known as our pancreas. I will talk about this later. The good news is the control center is also the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas, these very specialized groups of tissues in the pancreas. The effector, that means the part of the body that will do the action, that will produce the response, the effector is base, are basically the liver and or skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles are just muscles attached to your bones usually. All right. And the response, what exactly is the response? The response is the corrective action where they correct the blood glucose concentration. What I mean by this is if the stimulus is an increase in the blood glucose concentration, the response will be a decrease in the blood glucose concentration. But if the stimulus is a decrease in the blood glucose concentration, the response is an increase in the blood glucose concentration. This is all negative feedback. So what exactly is this islets of Langerhans all about anyway? Such a fancy name. Now, I'm drawing out the pancreas here. And in the pancreas, you have to know that they have these very specialized groups of tissues. And then I know it looks everything looks very pink and dense at the surrounding area. But look at the area in the middle where it's kind of whitish. And they, they form this sort of island, okay, in a way, sur surrounded by a pink ocean. And that is referred to as the islets of Langerhans. Now, the islets of Langerhans, what is the islet? Islets are just basically small groups of islands grouped together. So that's what it looks like. It just looks like a bunch of islands grouped up together. All right. The islets of Langerhans are made out of two types of cells. They are a tissue and they are made out of two types of, two types of cells, the alpha cells and beta cells. You have to remember this. Okay, and what are their functions? Their function is, remember, they act as receptors because they can detect the changes in the blood glucose concentration. They will know whether the glucose concentration in the blood is too high or too low. And here's the important thing. They are not only the receptors, but they are also the control centers because they are the ones that send the signal to the effector. All right, and how do they send the signal to the effector? They secrete hormones to control blood glucose concentration. Now, the alpha cells are releasing, are supposed to secrete a hormone known as glucagon, and the beta cells will secrete a hormone known as insulin. If you have studied O-level or IGCSE biology, you would have studied uh, the glucagon and insulin where insulin is supposed to decrease the blood glucose concentration and glucagon is supposed to increase the blood glucose concentration. But if you have not studied that, do not worry. We are going to look at that in detail.